Welcome to On Top of PR with Jason Mudd, presented by Review Maxer. Hello and welcome to On Top of PR. I'm your host, Jason Mudd with Axia Public Relations. I'm joined today by Bob Dietzel. Bob is here to talk to us about insurance. It sounds boring, but I'm going to make it interesting for us today because together we're going to talk about how you might use your corporate insurance policy to leverage the ability to hire a PR agency during the event of a crisis situation. Bob, welcome to the show. Glad you're here. I'm pleased to be here. Thank you for inviting me. (laughs) We're glad to have you too. Um, So, Bob, I, I'm seeing this more and more year over year, so I thought it'd be important that we do an episode about it. And, uh, you know, you seem like the right guy to, to involve in this conversation. So let me paint a picture for you. I'm sure you've seen it many times, but I don't know that our audience has. So you've got a scenario where your company has come under crisis and you're looking for outside counsel from a PR agency. And many of our clients are, and they're often new to us when they're experiencing crisis, they call us and it's almost like they pick up the red phone like Batman and they're calling in under a duress, if you will. And they say, hey, we're in the middle of a crisis. Can you help us out? And we're like, sure, of course we can. You know, we're learning more information about it. And I've learned to ask a very smart question, which is, have you checked with your insurance carrier or your insurance agency? You may have coverage for something like this to be able to hire a PR firm. Bob, that's my layman's description, and I'm leaning on you very heavily for this episode. So you might tell us uh, how does this happen and what do companies need to be thinking about before, during, and after a crisis situation? Well, that's an excellent way to pose the question to your clients. However, if it's after a crisis, it may be too late. Uh, right. the, the question that you, want, you really want to pose to your clients before the crisis happens is, uh, whether or not one of their policies or many of their policies are endorsed to include um, endorsements that add coverages that insurance companies obviously have a selfish interest in this issue mm-hmm. because they want the post-crisis to go well uh, if they're insuring the peril that is part of that crisis. So the insurance community um, uses those terms. They use crisis management endorsements, uh, emergency response expenses endorsement, and obviously public relations endorsement. Okay, good. That's very helpful. So, um, how does a how? Let's say you're the chief marketing officer or a marketing director at a you know national brand. Bob, who, who would they turn to in-house internally? Who would they go to to ask them to start having conversations about, do we have this coverage? And maybe even lobbying or advoc- advocating to get it. Uh, typically, in most privately held companies, the insurance procurement process is through the CFO or the general counsel um, or the all the way up to the owner. Um, so the, you know, it's not none of those folks in a general uh, middle market, uh, top or middle market company may be experts on what is in every detail of those policies because sure. this endorsement is generally overlooked, um, but is part of the policy. So you know, asking your marketing department to inquire with the CFO or general counsel whether that there's coverage uh, available is the best first step. And if they're at a bigger publicly traded company, there's typically a chief risk officer, correct? Absolutely. A risk management department. Uh, They should be uh, well uh, uh, prepared to answer that question. Okay. And uh, as we're thinking about this, uh, you you said that, um, I don't want to misquote you, but it's not always uh, a well-known provision or or even even requested provision. Is, Is that what you were saying? Yes. I mean, our our firm utilizes a database approach to analyzing coverages and benchmarking them, uh, the competitiveness of coverage for commercial companies uh, in our uh, in, in in the industry. And what this database does is identifies uh, what carriers endorsements are available. So, for example, Uh, an umbrella liability policy. So a severe crisis is going to pierce your initial million dollar limit in the general liability and go into the umbrella. Many umbrellas, not all of them, because if you don't ask for the endorsement, you're not going to get it. Right. But if you do ask for it, 
you often will get it for no additional cost, depending on how much you're paying for that umbrella policy. So they're generally, so each and every policy has the ability to endorse this policy, directors and officers liability, uh, products recall, remember the Tylenol scare, sure. um, you know, the general liability or product liability policy throws you into the umbrella, remember the Ford Pinto, um, errors and emissions liability, law firms make getting involved in large cases or being alleged to have not handled a case well, um, employment practices liability, sexual harassment, um, direct, and also kidnap and ransom policies have this endorsement. Pollution legal liability policies, if there's a pollution incident that's pretty severe, may have a communications endorsement. Um, and even property, uh, major fires that may involve uh, neighbors uh, and injuries to neighbors. Uh, these are all the types of policies that can be endorsed to include this coverage. So before we move on, the, I guess the, at the end of the day, um, you know, to our audience who's either listening or watching this uh, podcast or video cast, uh, we've identified who in their organization they can go to and, and raise the question, you know, hey, are we covered by insurance if we have a crisis situation that we might be able to go and retain a PR firm uh, at that time? And so then that marketing corporate communications leader might then start looking either to their incumbent PR firm or, or start building a relationship or a database or a network or pre-screening uh, potential crisis communications firms. So when and if there is a crisis and they want to, you know, uh, take advantage of that endorsement, they can go out and, 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 and engage that PR firm with the confidence that they've got this coverage. Correct. And, and if, if a company has the time to put a, together a crisis communication plan, uh, mm -hmm. we always recommend that they outline those sources or potential sources of funds on each and every policy uh, so they can be ready to um, to engage the carrier uh, and get approval for the expenses. Now, often these, you know, crisis communication is uh, very quick. It doesn't, um, you have to spend the money quickly to get the work done. Um, so some of these policies are reimbursement policies. So mm -hmm. you spend the money for crisis communication, the policy reimburses you the expenses for that crisis communication later. Right. Yeah, exactly. So um, I first I got to say that research shows that for every dollar you spend on a on crisis planning, you'll save seven dollars during a crisis. So that's pretty good ROI, you know, to be thinking about crisis planning. And, uh, you know, almost always a company that's not a client that contacts us suddenly, they have no crisis plan. They don't know what they're doing. They also don't have time to negotiate with us or figure out, you know, what our proposal looks like. And that's why we just kind of created a landing page, axiapr.com slash crisis, where we've got various packages. And we can often advise them into, well, it sounds like you need this package or that package. But then they can always add on to it later just so things can get started. Because I know, I mean, you know, if you're in the middle of a crisis, you don't have time to wait on us to prepare a proposal. And we don't have time to wait on you to sign it. But at the end of the day, we don't want to start work till we feel like we've got some form of authenticity in the relationship. Um, so, Bob, uh, this is, I think, the first step. And this is a big action step I think people should take uh, at their companies to see, do I even have this? If you got it, um, start building a relationship with somebody you like, know, and trust they can get familiar with your company, maybe even engage them to do a plan like we discussed. If you don't have this policy, contact maybe your firm or whoever their current agent is, or maybe they've, you know, uh, working directly with a carrier or something and, and get that going. Uh, and so those seem like really clear action steps to get started. But Bob, what happens next? Like how does the brand or the company confirm that this is a crisis matter that's covered under their you know, policy that's triggered under the endorsement kind of thing? Well, that, that's a great, great question. Uh, as I mentioned before, there are, it's in, it can be endorsed to many different policies that are designed to protect companies from many different types of risk. For example, if you had a, a ransomware event or cyber liability event um, that, uh, that may have released uh, information, uh, confidential information of your clients, that is a problem, right? And there are cyber insurance policies. If you have a crisis management endorsement, the policy will say, and by the way, the limits 
negotiated on these things are twenty, usually twenty five thousand dollars at the low end for no cost uh, and premium, up to like three hundred thousand dollars we've seen in the marketplace uh, for reimbursement for these type of expenses. Uh, and if you need or want higher amounts, you know, for multinational large companies, um, that could be negotiated and available for probably likely an additional cost. But anyway, they, they, the way the policy reads is that the company will reinvest the uh, crisis expenses uh, by third parties. And, and when they, they, they define crisis protection loss and crisis, expansion, uh, um, crisis expenses inside the policy, there's no standard definition. So it's very important that the risk management department or the agent of the client inform the customer of how that re reads and maybe bring that information or that language to the PR firm uh, to make sure that that definition fits what mm -hmm. the crisis plan calls for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Bob, is it, is it very common that the, um, that the insured corporation uh, pays, like you described earlier, pays the P outside PR agency, or maybe even in some cases the outside law firm, of course, um, and then they're reimbursed. Is that like 99% of the time that's how that works? I would say you're, you're right. It's probably 90% of the time. Um, you can negotiate potentially having what they call pay in behalf coverage, uh, which would you know advance the, the funds directly to the PR firm. Or the law firm, um, as you mentioned, uh, but most of these endorsements are on a reimbursement basis. Uh, so that even better to understand what exactly is it is covered prior to you know triggering the services that you're looking for. Right, right. All right. Well, with that, Bob, we're going to take a quick break. Come back on the other side. I've got more questions for you about this, and I think the deeper we go, the more interesting it's going to get. So, stay with us, and we'll be back on the other side and help you stay on top of PR. You're listening to On Top of PR with your host, Jason Mudd. Jason is a trusted advisor to some of America's most admired and fastest-growing brands. He is the managing partner at Axia Public Relations, a PR agency that guides news, social, and web strategies for national companies. And now, back to the show. Welcome back to On Top of PR. I'm your host, Jason Mudd. Bob and I are talking about insurance and specifically what you and your company can do uh, in a crisis situation so that you suddenly have funds that you may not have budgeted for before to engage with a crisis PR agency using your insurance policy. Bob, thank you for sharing all of these insights. Uh, it's been very helpful to me to understand so I can be a better advisor to my clients and hopefully that the people who are listening here can also start thinking uh, very similarly uh, about their business and their organization. So we were talking before about what exactly is covered and how do you know when you're having a crisis situation. And then I asked you about, you know, getting reimbursed uh, kind of thing. Um, should there be some, is there some reasonable fear that, Bob, I'm going to go hire a PR agency to help us communicate through this crisis, but then our claim is denied uh, and we don't get reimbursed? That's always a fear when buying insurance. That's why it's so important to, to, uh, read the policy carefully and understand uh, what is contemplated by the coverage and what everyone should be aware of and understand that everything is negotiable. And there may be four or five, maybe six versions of the same coverage inside of an insurance company in the form of endorsements. Mm -hmm. uh, so understanding exactly uh, what is covered is important. And What's also important is many of these endorsements don't just cover public relations expenses. They cover other related medical expenses, funeral expenses, psychological counseling for your employees, travel expenses during a crisis event. Um, you know, there's, so when you're purchasing a limit of insurance, you, know, you have to understand that there may be other expenses that would erode the limit uh, and um, eliminate your access to PR if you need it. So Bob, I'm learning a lot as we're talking and that's why I wanted to have you on the show because I sense that our audience is potentially unaware of these um, endorsements and how to leverage them. We've talked about that a little bit. 
Um, but I do have another question, which is I got to imagine there's some sort of time limit, right? I mean, you, you need to bring the crisis attention scenario uh, to your insurance agent, your insurance broker, your insurance advisor in a timely manner. You can't work through the crisis and then months later go, you know what, maybe we should get reimbursed for that expense. Yes, the timing is key. And many of these endorsements have a section in it called conditions. Um, and those conditions outline the duties of the insured to the insurance company. Um, and the one, the sample I'm looking at on this my screen right now uh, requires a 24 hour uh, notice uh, of a crisis event. Okay. So, uh, it's very important to, you know, get the insurance company involved early uh, so they can help you um, respond in a responsible way in, in order to trigger uh, the coverage. And I, I got to imagine, Bob, someone like yourself is going to be an advocate to kind of help make sure that they're, you know, submitting and positioning it in, a, in the right way so that it, it does clear those, uh, what would that be, uh, underwriting or endorsement type hurdles, right? Absolutely. And most agencies or most credible agencies have a claims advocacy division. Uh, that division will read the policies for the insured. Um, that division will create emergency claim response plans at before, you know, before the coverage is enforced, they will alert the carrier, uh, the customer, what to do in the event of a claim. Uh, so they can help triage uh, the event for the customer without putting their coverage at risk at the same time. So maybe then the corporate communications professional listening to this call, the head of marketing listening to this call might, would they be some, would they say, Hey, to the internal person, uh, you know, the, the, the CFO or the chief risk officer or the risk management department, could they say, you know, Hey, would you put me in touch with the claims advocate so we could talk through some scenarios that, that might, you know, may or may not be covered. Is, is that a good idea? Uh, that's an excellent idea. Uh, as a matter of fact, we about 10 or 11 years ago, we had an event of one of our customers. Uh, there was a major fire. It was a school for adjudicated boys. There were three helicopters, news vans all over the place. Um, and uh, we got through it. They got through it. Um, we had um, we did not use a professional PR firm. They kind of winged it through our advice and research on, you know, what to do in an event like that when microphones are in everyone's uh, face. Right. Right. But after that, we came to the realization that we should be aligned with a PR firm or multiple PR firms that we can recommend to our clients mm -hmm. um, before the event occurs or even after the event occurs uh, to vet firms that do that are experts in this area. Uh, and, um, and 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 collaborate with them and network with them. So that um, turned into a emergency claims reporting procedures document with a panel of PR firms that we recommend to our clients. Yeah, and you know, I, I would think Bob that it doesn't cost anything to start building a relationship other than your time, right? And start kind of vetting and getting to know these people. Um, you know, and do I like them? Do I trust them? Uh, have they done it for others? Do I think they can do it for me? Just kind of these logical questions that you should be consciously or subconsciously thinking through. I, I think you have to be careful if you're suddenly asking them to write a plan. You've got to expect there to be some, you know, consideration exchange, aka, you know, some funds. Um, but you know, you could certainly interview uh, PR firms, um, you know, about their experience and capabilities and you know, what, how do they charge for crisis services? So you kind of have that awareness. And also, so when you call them, they've heard of you before and you're not some complete stranger who, you know, uh, everything is, you know, kind of going out of control. So it's kind of like, you know, if you're pregnant, you should probably meet the doctor that's going to deliver the baby once or twice before you just show up. Right. Um, so, you know, something like that, I think could be, you know, an example of, of, you know, just getting to know them. And certainly then if you vet a couple of firms and you like, know, and trust them and you see they've done this before and you feel like they're competent in it, that's when you could probably engage them to put together a, strategic, or a crisis communications plan. And if they did a nice job on that plan, then you probably want to keep them on your short list or on speed dial or something like that. But, you know, at the end of the day, if maybe the plan just doesn't seem that competent or you've lost some trust in, in that organization, 
then you can go find another firm to help you kind of write that plan out and, and just kind of have that. That's what I would do if I was in their seat. So. Absolutely. And if I was in your shoes, I would be reaching out to the major um, insurance companies in the area or insurance agencies in the area mm-hmm. that help customers manage through this process. Yeah. Uh, that, there, but it, we we don't like to refer PR firms after the loss. We like to re- right. introduce them to our customers before the loss, so they can help, um, you know, for a fee, uh, build a crisis management plan uh, for uh, before the claim happens, uh, and then the customer will have that as part of their disaster recovery plan. Your mm-hmm. name will be on the speed dial, and they'll all, they'll know that and trust that um, that you uh, you'll do a good job for them. Well, and you know. I- you triggered something I meant to say earlier, and thank you for that. And that is that, um, you know, I think there's, a, there, I think you need to think the person, the audience we're talking to today, should really also be thinking about geography and industry and several other factors. So, um, you know, I can tell you there's been many times where we've been hired by a company, not even our market, who has a, you know, facility in our local market, or. Um, perhaps, you know, they've had an accident occur with one of their trucks or vehicles in our market. So if you start thinking about your service footprint, where you have employees, where you have physical offices, factories, warehouses, where you have delivery vehicles, you know, happening or whatever it might be, where you have customers, you know, et cetera, you probably want to start thinking about, and, and I know the bigger the company, candidly, the more unreasonable this becomes, but, you know, if you've got five geographic markets where you have a strong presence, you may need five local PR agencies, at least on your speed dial, at least in your crisis plan that you've kind of pre-vetted or maybe the local general manager has gotten to know them or something like that. Um, so we've had scenarios, you know, we've got people, we've got 22 colleagues across North America. They're in different locations, satellite offices, home offices, you know, our own branches kind of thing. And so we've gotten crisis work because somebody's like, hey, You know, one of our truck drivers just ran over a school bus, you know, in Orlando. I see you've got an Orlando office. Can you take care of this for us? We've had other scenarios where a company said, I see you do a lot of work in X industry. We're in that industry and we're experiencing some issues or challenges with regulatory bodies or something like that. So this is starting to sound a little bit, if I'm being candid, like a little bit of a headache, like you actually have to prepare for these things, right, Bob? And so I think it's, <laughs> it, I think it's more than just having a local firm or if you're headquartered in one city, having that firm. But you really want to make sure you're working with a firm that is going to know the local marketplace and understand the stakeholders and the influencers and the media and, and, and things like that. So I think you need somebody who can help you in your own industry, maybe even in the, in the verticals that you're doing business in as well as those that can probably help you uh, geographically and, and, and otherwise. And if it were me, I might even task my incumbent PR firm to do some of this due diligence for us, right? Because at the end of the day, you're going to lean heavily on your incumbent PR firm and maybe task them with the responsibility of finding competent, you know, on boots on the ground uh, kind of representation in the event that the incumbent PR agency doesn't have people on the ground. Or maybe you task your people on the ground with finding some local resources. That's a great point. I, I never really thought of it that way um, in, in terms of your local knowledge of the, the media and the community and uh, the the uh, uh, the values of the communities that uh, our customers have locations in. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of a lot of big manufacturers, as you know, operate all over the country, and they have hard assets in in a lot of different states. Um, And those states and communities that they operate in are drastically different from a cultural standpoint. So um, yeah, uh, leaning on the um, incumbent PR firm uh, is a a great idea. Uh, You know, we provide risk management consulting as well. We wrap that with our uh, agent brokerage services, insurance brokerage services. So, you know, we can do the legwork for our customers to find local firms uh, for them, at least local firms to interview, you know, vet to interview, make a finalist. Uh, we've done that in the past. Uh, but you're right. I think the local representation for major operations in different towns uh, can be very important. Well, you know, there's that stereotype and I see it, you know, where 
you know, a company will go and hire, you know, a New York City agency because clearly they must be great. They're in New York City. But then when something happens in their backyard and that New York City agency is like, well, we can be on a plane and be there in a couple of days. That's not good when you're, you know, train derailed or whatever, or, you know, uh, you've got to, you know, I mean, we've been called in for an active shooter situation on a, one of our clients, you know, office locations, we've been called in and said, you know, Hey, there's an FBI raid at one of our offices. So in those, in some of those cases, um, and, and by the way, if you're really interested, we actually list some of these scenarios out on our website at axiapr.com slash crisis, because, you know, they, they make for great stories over cocktails or, a, or a dinner parties or whatever. But at the end of the day, um, you know, we've, we've helped clients manage crisis when we're not in that market. You don't always need to have boots on the ground, but sure, sure is helpful, um, you know, if, if you do. But if you don't, you can still survive it. I'm thinking of scenarios, you know, um, where, uh, you know, we had one of our offices, one of our clients' offices was had an FBI raid in Chicago. And, you know, they, they take everything, right? They, and they don't care that it's going to put you out of business or cause you harm or whatever it might be. At the end of the day, uh, you really need to kind of think through these things because they happen more often than not. We've, we've done another episode, uh, by the way, that, you know, what do you, what do you do when they're, you know, when your company or your leadership is involved in, you know, criminal, um, uh, charges or allegations. And so we talked to an attorney about that. And that's kind of what triggered this episode was this idea of having Bob, somebody, um, like yourself, come on and, and talk about this. I appreciate what you shared. As we're wrapping up here, um, I got a couple of quick questions. One would just be, what else did we not cover today that you think uh, folks at home need to be aware of? Uh, from an insurance perspective, it's, it's important to understand that reputation is a broad term and it's not insured. What is insured is crisis management, and that protects, helps protect your reputation in right. the event of a loss. Uh, so, you know, it can be critical in the result of a claim from a liability perspective or from a reputation perspective. Um, so when the building is burning down and there are news vans on the scene and helicopters in the sky um, or there's an accident and there's an ambulances on the scene and the fire engines are on the scene, they don't wait for you to respond in a professional manner, right? That's Whatever right. comes out of your mouth next um, is critical. Um, not just because, not just to get through the incident, but also get through the law, the following potential lawsuits that come from the incident. Right. And in front of a jury, that story doesn't sound as well as it should, as well as it should sound. Yeah. So that's the only other thing. The reputation's not covered. All the things that surrounded to help protect your reputation, attorneys, PR firms, um, that is covered by insurance. That makes a lot of sense. You're you're reminding me also of uh, you know scenarios where the clients, well, we're not ready to talk. We're not ready to talk. And then the journalist says to me, Jason, I'm under orders to get somebody to talk. And so I'm gonna start going through LinkedIn and just calling employees, you know through the list. I'm going to start looking at board members and calling board members. I'm going to start looking at the executive team. I'm going to call, you know, I've got to call the, my editors making me or my producers making me until somebody's willing to talk. Right. And this particular scenario I'm thinking of was on Christmas Eve, you know, and they're like, I know you don't want us calling people at home on Christmas Eve to talk about this story. And so eventually, you know, that was leveraged and we used it to, you know, convince the client, somebody's got to talk or else you don't know who's going to talk, but eventually they're going to find somebody to talk. And so I think that's something the crisis plan should work through as well, just as a little kind of added nugget here at the end, Bob. Uh, are there certain carriers that you sense are more uh, crisis management, uh, crisis communication endorsement friendly? Uh, I would say most of the national carriers are uh, have this uh, – type of endorsement and um, maybe some of the local carriers you'll have to ask for it and maybe beg a little bit beg right. for it uh, or their agent will have to provide sample endorsements from other carriers to help them build something okay. uh, but pretty much you know i wrote down in my notes all of them we don't not ask for it you know you ask until you get in this right. business and and uh the carriers copy off each other uh, and they uh, they always want to compete from a right. from a products and a standpoint. So uh, they all have them. Uh, so don't be afraid to ask for it. Okay. 
And so if somebody is tuning in and, and they're like, man, this is really interesting. I have questions that I wish Jason would have asked, or I need a policy review, or maybe, hey, we're not happy with our current insurance guy. Uh, Bob, how do people get a hold of you? How would you like them to reach out to you? Uh, I'm pretty easy to find on the internet. It's Robert Dietzel, where KMRD Partners is our firm. Um, and uh, we would be very happy to do an assessment on anyone's policies. Um, it is a fact-based process here. We, we analyze the, your policies against other policies with the same carrier and all the carriers in the marketplace. And we'll give you uh, a really honest evaluation uh, of what, what, you, uh, what you have. Uh, and if something comes of it and, we, and you need us, uh, but if you don't, we'll tell you. Uh, they will tell you that your agent's doing a good job and thank them for negotiating great coverage. Yeah, I, I've uh, I've done that before where I've had, you know, I'm like, I've, you know, as a small business owner, I've had a policy. I'm like, I feel like I'm overpaying for this and I have no claims and I have whatever. And they've been like, Jason, I don't think I can help you. You've got a pretty good policy here. So that, you know, makes me feel good. I think it's good to get a, uh, you know, a second opinion on something like that, especially if it's become routine where you're, you know, paying, you know, the premium is going to go up every year, folks. That's just the reality, right? But like you said, I think you said earlier uh, that, you know, a lot of times people ha are overinsured or have a little extra coverage than they might need. And they may have coverages in areas that they, that they do need, but they're not covered yet. And so I think it's good to have kind of that uh, advisory role and that trusted uh, advisor in your corner who can ask you some of these questions that, you know, maybe uh, somebody else who's working on a volume basis isn't really thinking about. Yeah, absolutely. In, in, in most cases, we find that programs are competitively priced because price is the most easy thing to negotiate. Uh, however, we find more often than not that they're not getting the coverage they deserve for the price that they pay. Okay, that makes um, sense. And that's just based on knowledge. You negotiate with knowledge. And if you um, know more than your the carriers know, which often we do, mm -hmm. uh, we know sometimes the underwriters don't even know the endorsements. They are in their toolbox that, we, um, yeah. that we've seen before. Uh, so we ask for it, we get it, uh, and we go from there. Well, Bob, for our audience, I honestly hope they never, ever have to deal with any of the things we're talking about today and that life is just perfect for them. There's never any crisis situations. But we both know from experience it's a matter of when, not if, you deal with something like this. And so you may as well take the steps to prepare so that if it never happens, you're very grateful. But when it does happen, you're even more grateful. And you appear, in my opinion, to be even more of a, a competent leader in your organization who has their stuff together that's working on behalf of advocating not only for the company and its best interest in the brand, but also the greater good of the community you work in and, and the industry, you know, uh, leading the way and the thoughts on that. So that's a big calling and a big endeavor, and I completely get it. But, you know, I'll just say if, if Bob or I can be of helpful to you uh, on this topic, I hope you'll reach out to us. And with that, I think, Bob, we're, we're done here today. Um, I think we accomplished our mission together. Thank you for your cooperation and support here. And uh, we appreciate you being on the show today. And to our audience tuning in, uh, thank you for helping me help you stay on top of PR. And if you have any questions about crisis communications or insurance policies, I'll be sure to put my contact information and Bob's in the episode notes. Please reach out. We love hearing from our audience, even if it's just to say that you liked X, Y, or Z in our episode, or you wish I would have asked Bob, you know, something else. And we'll be sure to post about that on social media. I'll track down Bob, answer your questions, or you can just reach out to him directly. He'd be glad to hear from you. So if you found this episode helpful, please share it with a colleague uh, who you think would benefit from it as well. With that, I'm Jason Mudd signing off with Axia Public Relations. We want to thank Bob for his participation in today's episode. Be well. This has been On Top of PR with Jason Mudd, presented by ReviewMaxer. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And check out past shows at ontopofpr.com.